introduce Maggie Steer. Uh, Maggie is a familiar face and name for many of you. She's worked for nonprofits of all sizes during her long career in preservation, education, and museums. Highlights include founding director at the Fells in Newberry, field service rep for the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance for a good decade, uh, and interim director at Canterbury Shaker Village. She also chairs the Wolfboro Heritage Commission and is vice chair of the Wentworth Watershed Association. Susan Tresh Feinberg is an independent consultant specializing in strategic planning, market analysis, and program development for nonprofit organizations. For more than 40 years, she has helped public and private organizations throughout New England build their capacity to address community needs. So we're really fortunate to have both of them presenting today. And with that, Maggie, I will have you share your screen and get this party started. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to remind people that muting yourself means that you're not uh, interrupting other people if something should happen where you are. So, um, oh, except. Ah. Maggie, we can't hear you. There we go. Could that it was be my fault. that everyone no, was you're fine. It's good, Maggie. Great. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna move right into the meat of my presentation. Why are you here? And if you don't see yourself in one of those four labeled categories, maybe there are um the boxes with question marks. Um, and you might just make a note about that because that might come in handy. What do you need to know? And if you don't get answers at the end of this presentation, ask in the question and answer section. These are things that Andrew and I used to hear all the time when we were out on the road and which we as board members ourselves often hear. Maggie, is your, do you want to share your screen? Oh. Sorry, hold on. Hold on. You see that now? Right. Is that clear? Beautiful. Yeah. Looks good. Great. Thank you so much. Good now. Okay. Um, and how do I hide? That's right. Hiding the video. So I'll give you a minute to just look at this. I'm sorry I hadn't screen shared. So the legal duties of a nonprofit are often summarized in these three phrases, duty of care, duty of loyalty, and duty of obedience. You have to pay attention that you are making prudent use of all assets, including the facility, people, and goodwill. Um, duty of loyalty, ensure that your activities and transactions are advancing your miss mission and disclose conflicts of interest make decisions that are in the best interest of the nonprofit, not individual board members. And the obedience piece, ensure that you obey applicable laws and regulations, follow your own bylaws and that you adhere to your stated mission. Uh, register with the Secretary of State's office, file annual reports, submit a 990 to IRS. There's a guidebook put out by the New Hampshire Secretary of State's office that you should access online. Um, if you ignore this piece of what you're supposed to do, you do risk your nonprofit status. General responsibilities can be summarized again in this phrase, foresight, oversight, and insight, taking a broad view of the organizational goals and creating strategic plans to get you there. Many of you are in small organizations and board members do management and staff. You fundraise, you're advocates for the nonprofit's missions. And if you have paid staff, you hire 
set the compensation for and supervise and evaluate the executive director who then runs the day-to-day -day organization. Think of it as the board members being up in the crow's nest, scanning the horizon for signs of storms or rainbows to explore. Board members, remember, are serving as volunteers too. How to recruit board members. Be very clear about expectations for board service. And that means having materials that explain what you are asking people to do. Every board member should be prepared to make a financial commitment to the organization. This isn't really optional. Really optional. It, it, people must do it. Um, and you must be clear that that's what they are expected to do as part of their board service. The length of board terms and number of terms allowed needs to be spelled out. You should have um, a way to change the composition of the board as needs change over time, while also allowing people to cycle off the board when, um, when they're ready or when you're ready. Term limits typically are one, two, three, or four years at the most. Um, frequency of board meetings. You may meet once a month, you may meet more often, you may meet less often. Um, again, it's up to what your board needs are, but governing boards should probably meet at least quarterly. And my fourth point here is about committees of vol or volunteer service. Most boards have these various committees. All board members should be ex expected to serve on at least one committee. Make sure you have solid bylaws that will govern how you run the organization. And it is really important that you follow them. And I hope all of you have that. If you don't, we can answer your query about um, how to get them. If you have no paid staff, your board is doing it all and that can feel overwhelming. So try to get committees for the major areas of operations that you know you're going to need. Um, you wanna start with a vision and clear work plans for each of those committees, what you expect them to accomplish, and then break the work down into man manageable chunks to avoid burnout and conflicts. Invite people to be on a committee who aren't necessarily on the board. It's a great way to test new candidates for board service. The size of your board does matter. Typically boards have seven to 15 people. I've been on boards where it's as high as 21 and that is um, not an easy number to work with. I think it's helpful to emphasize the value of building consensus and building enough time into your process so that everyone does get heard, shares their opinions, and perhaps if people um, aren't ready to vote and you have the option, table it for a next meeting so that um, everybody can just sit with the ideas a little bit longer. And um, again, I'm an advocate for smaller boards of not more than 15. Recruit and develop a high functioning board. This is really important, not just the volunteers who might say, gee, I'm interested in working with you, but people who have those three skills of work, wealth, and wisdom, plus those who might be willing to be witnesses or champions of your work, perhaps prominent people within the community. And the wallop is people with special skills who can take you to the next level or who really are more visionary so that they can help the board see the potential of what you're trying to do. Get outside referrals, not just people you know. Make sure you have all board members disclose any conflict of interest and make sure these are people that you really can work with, that there's a fit with your board culture. Think strategically about what kind of people your organization actually needs. You need volunteers to do the work, but not all volunteers will make good board members. Figure out what expertise you need and fill your board positions accordingly. Someone who can raise money is great. Someone who can get the word out about what you do. That's the communications piece. 
Maybe you need a lawyer on the board who can provide some legal assistance and remind you of your legal obligations. Maybe you need somebody who will do the communication and write press releases and start a website and do social media for you. All these kinds of things are really important. But your needs will change over time and early startups need different things than a mature organization. Um, build in succession strategies. We have a board member who had no fundraising experience but learned and was passionate and successful and willing to take on more responsibilities as a committee chair or an officer as time goes by. So if you see the potential in someone, start them off with a good basis of information and help them develop their skills. Board orientation and training is vital, absolutely important, and you need to take it seriously. Have printed materials for both prospective board members to review um, after or before you meet with them and spend time keeping board members, current board members, informed and engaged. This can be the executive director of the organization who does it, the board chair, or some other person like the head of the nominating and governance committee. I love this rule of thumb, do 10 minutes of training at each meeting or do it three to four times a year, just so the board understands your key documents, um, the strategic plan, board succession planning, anything you want them to understand about how your organization is running is important. And provide a handbook with the key documents to everybody. Effective board meetings allocate the bulk of the time to mission critical activities. They use the committee structure to handle operations and include brief verbal or written reports at the meeting. You can save time by having your committee chairs submit just a written summary of, of their work. And from time to time, as I said, do the board training or invite a guest speaker who might help to educate your board in a broader context than just what your organization is doing. And don't forget to build the camaraderie of the board and a sense of shared purpose by making time to socialize and from time to time celebrating your major milestones that you've achieved. If your board is stuck, try something new that will give you a sense of accomplishment. A new exhibit, a paint job, even some landscaping or cleaning up around your building. The public will take notice and you'll feel good about making some visible progress. Now, there are pitfalls to board service. <laughs> Wealthy donors, for example, might expect control and accountability in exchange for their important giving, which is reasonable, except when they don't understand how the organization's management needs to work effectively. Um, there's something called founder syndrome, which is the third thing on this list. Often that's the same thing as a wealthy donor who maintain disproportionate power and influence. Sometimes even after their board service has ended and they're emeritus, they wanna to come to the board meetings and having them in the room almost automatically makes others defer to them. A board chair needs to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, those who contribute primarily their time on the other end of the spectrum often struggle to feel heard um, and to strike the right balance between too much engagement and too little. The board chair is really key to making sure that everyone is treated equally and gets a chance to participate equally. Keep your board members engaged and active and understand their motivations for serving. Make sure they believe in the mission. Their employer may encourage community service. So you might ask someone from a local bank, for instance, if someone of their employees would like to help support a nonprofit in the community, and you can get someone with certain financial skills on your board. Some people are just engaged in your work and um, everybody should feel that they have a level of engagement, both as a board member and as a volunteer. Each one should have specific expertise to contribute. When you talk to them about joining the board, ask this question, 
How do you feel you could make a difference on our board and pay attention to their answer and make sure that they get what they need to keep them engaged? Some people want recognition in the community or among their peers. Make sure they're getting that. Some people want to learn something new or just have a sense of service or accomplishment. These, all of these things and a combination of them can motivate your board members, but you need to make sure they're all engaged and happy. Um, and have one-on-one -on -one meetings with them to find out how they are feeling about their service and adjust accordingly. Um, be well organized. Send out your meeting agendas at least a week in advance. Send the minutes out within one week following the meeting. Make sure that any action items or assignments at, that are made are clearly documented in the minutes and point those out when you send them. Make sure you have all the necessary information available to the board members, whether it's on a shared Google Docs drive, um, in a hardbound notebook that you give them, or some other form. Choose a consistent schedule for meeting dates and publicize those often. It's really difficult to have those jumping around, but if people can say at the beginning of the year, okay, I know my board meetings are going to be on the last Friday of every other month, then they can calendar it and it's never a question. It's good actually when you're interviewing board members to let them know when your board meets and if they have a conflict with that, then you have to move on to the next candidate. Um, and finally, do an annual report or at least a brief summary of your work and distribute that to all of your supporters. You might even want to have an event at the end of the year that celebrates what you've done and some uh, testimonials about progress, a slideshow, something like that. Other tools for success, typically these are for larger organizations, but always good to keep in mind. There is something called a board self-assessment. Um, a template for that is available from the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits. And if um, your board does this maybe once every year or every two years, it gives you as leadership a sense of what board members need and want from their board service and how they're feeling about whether or not they're getting it. So I would recommend that as a tool. A performance evaluation for your executive director, if you have one, should be carried out every year and that precedes the negotiation of salaries and benefits for the following year. Um, and then think about succession planning again, just making sure that you've got a pipeline of people who are going to fill vacant board seats as they occur. If you talk to a great candidate, they may say, you know, I don't have time right now, but I might be freer after I retire from my regular job. Or you might read in the newspaper that someone has just retired from a regular job and set up a time to meet and talk with that person. We had a board chair um, so it's not only getting people on the board, but it's also those positions of leadership with on the board. And we had a board chair who would not take on the role of chair until his successor had been identified. He knew that when he was ready to step down, there would be someone to take the reins. And he also knew he wanted to um, make sure that that person was brought in onto into all the major issues um, of the of the board so that there would be great continuity. Finally, there are lots of resources out there to help nonprofit boards. The Preservation Alliance is always happy to answer your calls. We refer people to things like BoardSource, which is a nonprofit resource, the New Hampshire Center for Nonprofits, which is a membership organization, but has lots of great resources for you and does more training on board related issues. The National Council of Nonprofits, again, a nonprofit, great website, more information. The New Hampshire Department of Justice, Charitable Trust Division. I mentioned that in the beginning because they have a handbook for nonprofits that everybody should get a hold of and familiarize themselves with. And then things like Nonprofit Leadership Lab um, or the Foundation Group, 
if you just Google the topics you're interested in, a lot of these sites will come up. Don't forget about informal meetings with peer organizations too. It's great sometimes to just take your board or a, a few of your board members and go visit another organization somewhere else that does what you do. You can learn a lot from them. And at the very least, you'll feel like you have um, some colleagues who are struggling with the same issues that you're struggling with. Just a reminder, we are recording this. We'll send a link to the program to everybody so you don't need to take a lot of notes on this. It'll all be there for you. So I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, we have a few that have come in the chat. Um, so if if there are more questions, uh, maybe the best way to do it is, is through the chat function and I'll, uh, I'll comb through them. Um, David asks, can board members' financial contributions be in-kind? Yes, I would say sure. I'd keep track of them. Um, and there is a way to keep track of volunteer hours. And if you're applying for grants, in-kind contributions count for some of those too, like an LCHIP grant. So it's great to keep track of in-kind work, yes. Uh, I would say though, if that in-kind contribution is as a volunteer when there are a lot of other people say at a work day, um, then everybody should get credit for that, not just one person. Um, how could you get rid of a bad board member? Uh, a tricky issue. Um, I think it's helpful to identify what the issues are and then take them to lunch or something like that and say, you know, um, we're, we're struggling with your participation or your conduct in meetings or your lack of donations. And so, uh, we hoped we were clear at the outset of what our expectations were. Um, are you still willing to stay on the board? They may say no. They may say, no, it's painful. I don't want to do it. Susan may have another answer for that, or Andrew might. <laughs> It's very difficult, but I think you just need to ask them, do you want to continue on the board? You probably are aware that we're having some struggles and challenges. I or do you have a, a, a suggestion here. The best way to deal with difficult or um, obstructionist or whatever word you want to use board members is to be very careful in your recruitment. And um, so that you don't end up in that situation, it really points to how important it is to engage people in um, roles that are not board membership. So you can get to know the person and how they work, for example, on committee, um, and, and then be, just be very careful on who you invite to join your board. Um, and then once things do get difficult, I think Maggie is pointing out your only option, which is to speak directly with the person and give them a graceful way to resign should they choose. Um, but. Um, this, this question is uh, how to encourage uh, cycling off or term limits when you you have slim pickings to begin with. Um, I think that's something that a strong nominating and governance group would need to address. And um, I guess part of what I would say is maybe you need to do more communications about what your group is doing and accomplishing and what your vision is so that more people have heard of you. Uh, you may need to go outside your small community to get some other folks to help you. I don't know, Andrew, you're on a board, I think in a very small town and you've seen boards in very small towns of even communities of only 200 people. That's difficult. And one solution might be to merge with a regional board that does preservation in several different towns and then draw people from other communities. And maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh... I think that's my, maybe what we're going to see with a lot of historical societies or um, it, we saw it in the land conservation world, right? Um, in the past, maybe two decades, we've seen a lot of merging of land conservancies. Um, maybe not just because of 
for development, but um, just kind of uh, granting, I guess, more power, um, better decision making, a, a more powerful organization. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is that a heritage commission might be able to take on some preservation work. And we have someone here with us today who is a member of the DAR, which um, has as part of its mission, historic preservation. And I've seen them take on a preservation project and they have a much broader mission, but they might decide, okay, for the next three years, we're really gonna focus on helping this one building or project. So, I'd say that's a, that's an instance where you might call us and we can do some strategizing with you in a more specific way. <laughs> and thank you to the DAR. You know who you are. Um so we can we'll take more questions uh I think after Susan's part and and maybe Susan's uh, presentation will will uh, encourage even more questions. Um Susan, do you want to take the reins? Sure. Um, let me share my screen. Let me know if it's happened. Success. Great. Okay, just a second. I have to... Um... Here we go. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, before plunging into my topic, I'd like to set the stage with a couple of cartoons. Um, believe it or not, if you Google strategic planning cartoons, you're going to be flooded with results. And most of them look something like this. Um, it says at the bottom, the fate of every strategic plan ever written. And this fellow says, it's been five years since we developed a new strategic plan. And the other fellow says, oh, I know where the last one is. Someone put it on my shelf after they finished it. And it hasn't moved since. Susan, um, I think you, could you share your screen again? Okay. There we go. Got it? Okay, thank you, Andrew. So uh, you might ask, why do they sit on the shelf? Um, here is one reason. Here we have an executive who is so proud of this plan. He's just finished, probably behind closed doors, with lots of ego and effort invested in it. And as he says, if you turn to page 136, that's when things start to get interesting. And then around the table, what do you see? The staff who's going to be responsible for implementing this tome, and they're scratching their heads and saying, what am I supposed to do with this? And so it not only ends up on the shelf, you see it's uh, been tossed into the janitor's closet. So my point is that these cartoons would not be funny if they didn't reflect a very common experience. Um, and which is not so funny. And that is a lot of time, effort, and often money is invested in strategic planning that in the end has very little value for the organization. So if that's the case, why do we bother? Why do we go to the effort? Well, I think the purpose of almost every nonprofit strategic plan is um, to help the organization achieve greater impact and sustainability. Both those goals are critically important. Of course, impact refers to your admission, fulfilling, advancing your mission, which is what you're there for. Sustainability um, is all about your organization's capacity to cope with the challenges that every nonprofit faces. The first thing that comes to mind probably is financial sustainability. That's definitely something you want to address in your strategic plan. But also there are other threats to sustainability. For example, if you're a really small all-volunteer organization, the board does it all from grant writing to um, financial reporting to mowing the grass with no backup for your essential tasks. And so this is a recipe for burnout and a lot of stress because of worry about single points of failure. What if this person leaves or that person leaves? So that really is a threat to sustainability. Sometimes you do a plan because your environment is changing and you need to um, 
prepare for that. Perhaps a large source of revenue is in jeopardy, or perhaps there are much more competition for existing dollars, or perhaps there's an opportunity coming down the line and you wanna um, prepare your organization to take advantage of it. Another reason, and it could be the sole reason, a very good one is to support your fundraising. More and more major uh, grant sources require a strategic plan. Um, and also the strategic plan will help you if it's done well, make the case for funding. But I think perhaps the most important reason uh, to engage in strategic planning is to generate renewed focus and energy among your staff and board alike. And a well-designed and run strategic pro planning process will do that. So what is strategic planning to begin with? Um, I like a very simple definition, uh, which is that a strategic plan is a document that defines a future state for an organization and how it plans to get there. Um, there is a very uh, familiar phrase, I'm sure you've all heard, that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So your plan envisions where you're going and provides that roadmap. Um, the kind of planning that I find most useful is a, uh, involves a five-step process. First, you want to form your strategic planning committee. And even though strategic planning is um, the purview of the board, you definitely want to include staff as well on the strategic planning committee. Um, possibly also you will want to include um, experts in your field, get some outside voices. And excuse me, the second um, step in the process is gathering and analyzing information, developing the foundational elements. I'm going to review all of these steps, creating an implementation timeline. And then finally, I think the part that um, ends up relegating so many plans to the shelf is that the organization fails to monitor progress and make adjustments along the way. So the strategic planning committee, as I was beginning to reference, should have board and staff representation, starting with the board chair and the executive director, but ideally also people who are on the front line and will be responsible for implementing much of the plan. You'll also want to have an expert in the field who's not part of the organization to give an outside view and that kind of perspective, and perhaps representation from the community that you're serving. The qualifications would be a passion for the organization's mission, time to commit to the process, which means when you're looking for folks, you let you need to let them know how long it's gonna take, how many meetings they'll need to attend, and ask that they be available to provide input between meetings so that you can make efficient use of your meeting time. And then finally, though I haven't said this, you wanna choose people who have demonstrated their ability to listen and to collaborate. If you have on your strategic planning committee, someone who has a definite idea of exactly what the organization should be doing and is not a good listener, that's really going to slow you down. Perhaps you can deal with that person, especially if they're a supporter um, in your interviewing and information gathering phase, which we will turn to now. This part of the process is basically to provide a clear picture of your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, your threats, those elements of the canonical SWOT analysis. I'm sure you've all been involved in that at one stage or another in your career. Um, so this is sort of the groundwork. By identifying these things, you'll say throughout the strategic planning process, does this plan address the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats that we identified in the information gathering phase? One way that you can gather information is through interviews and focus groups with key stakeholders, which would include experts in the field, staff, board members, community members. You can do that also in focus groups, but I would like to um, suggest one caveat about this. When you interview people or hold focus groups as part of a strategic planning process, you want to make sure that you reflect back to those people the fact that you have heard what they said, um, documented it, and considered it as part of the process. 
otherwise you have a bit of a public relation issue. We, you don't want to ask questions of people and then not respond to the information that they've provided to you. A literature review is going to um, give you a clear view of what best practices are in your field, what org other organizations with similar challenges have done to address those. It provides a great um, context for your planning. An environmental scan would be uh, a matter of looking at what your funding opportunities are, what your competition and comparable organizations are doing, um, what kind of challenges you see coming down the pike. Um, so that also provides great context. An operations and finance review will help you be really clear-sighted about what the challenges you have um, in executing your mission and vision. Um, and it will give you uh, a set of issues that you'll want to address in the strategic plan. And then finally, you might wanna do a little financial modeling. If you have some ideas about the direction you might wanna take or staff you might wanna bring on to do some financial performa that, that tells you what kind of resources would be needed or um, what kind of impact it would have on the organization financially is gonna be really useful information for you to tap as you proceed with the planning process. The next step in the process is to is developing the plan's foundational elements. And I'm sure you've heard um, of mission, vision, and values over and over when you think about or Google information on strategic plans. But there are two other elements that are just as important, intended impact and strategic priorities. So I'm going to review what each of these elements are. What they do is they provide both the bedrock of your plan and also the compass, the true north, the direction that you want to maintain, the focus that you want to maintain over the period of, say, five years that this plan is designed to address. It all starts with mission, of course. Now, even if you love your current mission statement, it's very good as part of your strategic planning process to um, put it to this test. Uh, you want to ask yourself, does it not just convey what you do, but the difference that your organization aims to make in the world? What are the results of your effort? Is it inspirational? Is it concise and memorable? If you have a mission that people can't easily um, state and remember, it's, it's not going to serve you very well. And then finally, does it help you make decisions and set priorities? Can you know from this mission statement what is aligned with your mission and what will be um, diverting or fragmenting um, if you were to take it on? So beyond that, you might want to, excuse me, I need to go back. Well, I'll just leave it here. You might want to um, include something about what you do and um, your service area. An example of a mission statement that I recently helped Mascoma Valley Preservation put together is this. They, they did have like a paragraph long statement. Now the statement reads, Mascoma Valley Preservation saves historic places to promote the vitality of our rural communities. Very easy to remember. And I think the shortest mission statement that packs a punch that I ever came across was jobs, not jails. So um, so with that said, let's move on to the second of the foundation elements, which is your vision statement. There are two types. The one you most commonly see is the kind that describes the world that the organization is helping to create. For example, um, the vision statement of Oxfam is a world without poverty. Now, this kind of vision certainly um, resonates with the mission and is quite inspiring. And there's nothing wrong with having this kind of vision statement, but it's not all that helpful for strategic planning. Instead, the second type of vision statement is, is what you want to aim for in your process or um, combine with the first type. And that is to create a vision statement that describes the future state of the organization what the strategic plan is designed to build towards. For example, in five years, your preservation organization will um, have projects in 
X number of towns have a sustainable basis of revenue and a small staff that works in collaboration with its board. This would be the des destination of the plan that you're creating. The next foundational element is your values. And this is not just fluff. Oftentimes you'll see um, as a value statement in a strategic plan, words like integrity, respect, transparency. There's nothing wrong with these things and you, and you can bring them as a lens um, to your decision-making to decide if your decision is consistent with those values, but it's not nearly as useful um, as a value statement that is more rooted in the type of work that you do and the beliefs and values that motivate you, what you do and how you do it. Um, for example, the uh, one of the value statements of Mascoma Valley Preservation is that MVP values ecologically responsible development, which its projects aim to achieve and inspire. Statements like that will probably be more useful to you as you implement your plan. This next um, foundational element um, is increasingly important to funders. It's very much like your mission statement, but it's much more specific. It will have a measurable component. It will be time bound, for example, in 10 years, we will have had this impact in this community that is measurable in these ways, and it defines your geography and your target population. This creates a framework for evaluation, which is increasingly important, not just for increasing your impact, but for fundraising. And then finally, you wanna create your strategic priorities. These define the primary means of achieving your organizational vision. They are key, areas of focus. For example, one strategic priority might be to diversify and increase your funding base. Another might be to um, create a more sustainable organizational structure to build your capacity. Um, another might be to develop alternatives to acquisition for saving historic places. You don't want to have a long laundry list of strategic priorities, or it will be very hard to keep your focus and very hard to make difficult decisions about what opportunities to pursue and what to let go. So then once you have these foundational elements, mission, vision, values, strategic priorities, and intended impact statement, you're ready to create your implementation timeline, which is the fourth step. This is where the rubber meets the road. It is um, your roadmap. It breaks down these large strategic priorities into SMART objectives and discrete tasks. SMART's an acronym for um, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. Your, your implementation timeline will also assign the lead for each task, who will do each of the tasks that you have in the timeline. Very important. If you can't assign someone, then it's just going to float and, and not get done. You monitor your timeline regularly, and it's typically an internal document. I'll get back to these last two points. Um, I like to create a timeline in a visual way, like this Gantt chart demonstrates. So your priority, for example, to get back to fundraising might be to increase and diversify your funding base. Well, you want to create smart objectives about that. And that could be, say, to double your donor base within five years. Then what are the tasks for implementing that? You could look back to the best practices that you um, identified in your information gathering phase and lay out a critical path for achieving this priority. And then uh, over on the right here, you'll see what quarter you're assigning each task to. If when you create this, you have a whole lot of color in year one, and it's just kind of peters out in two and years two and three, you'll know you need to do a better job at advancing and um, scheduling the tasks. You want to also make sure that you've created a critical path that is that the things that you do in year one set you up for success in year two and year three. Now, I said earlier that you wanna constantly monitor 
your progress in your implementation plan timeline, and you're also going to be continuously um, updating and refining it. And why? Because as, as well as you plan, as much as you think you know what the future will bring, uh, reality looks like this. There's always the unexpected. So for that reason, as you monitor and you're unable because of things that happen you didn't anticipate to execute a particular task in the time frame you identified, then you say, well, what else might we do to advance this objective and to meet this priority? And how can we regroup to do that? And you shouldn't be worried about making these changes because what they reflect is a learning organization that is able to take in what happens, readjust, stay true to your foundational elements, your vision, vision, mission, vision, values, and priorities, and keep on track towards realizing your vision. And this is the reason that I recommend that your plan, your implementation timeline be an internal document. You, you don't want to be criticized for not keeping exactly to the implementation timeline because you're going to need to be adjusting them. So keep this as an internal document if you can. Um, so finally, how do things go right? Very quickly, I mean, how do you keep your plan not from not ending up in the janitor's closet. First of all, you need enthusiastic buy-in from the people who are responsible for implementing the plan, which is why you want representation of staff and board and committee people on your um, strategic planning committee. You wanna be having conversations with stakeholders throughout the process to gather input. And then as you formalize your ideas, you may wanna vet them, especially with outside experts to get their input onto whether they think that this is a reasonable plan for moving forward. You wanna balance the aspirational, which would be in your vision, your intended impact and um, your values with the practical. Look at your roadmap. Is this doable? Is this doable within the time frame? Um, and that's a very important balance to strike. And then finally, to closely monitor your implementation timeline and adjust it as needed. Finally, just to circle back to um, Maggie's presentation, I'd like to quickly speak to how planning fosters board development. First of all, it educates the board. It deepens their knowledge of the field, of internal operations, the operating environment. You wanna be sure to share everything from your information gathering phase to the entire board. It also defines the role of the board in plan implementation. If you have uh, an implementation plan um, timeline and it doesn't have specific tasks assigned to the board, I think you've missed the boat a little bit. You wanna keep them engaged, not just as monitors, but as full participants in implementing the plan. And finally, um, the plan will identify where you need new folks, new capacities, new skills, to implement um, your vision and your intended impact. So um, with that, I'll take questions. We have a few minutes. I have, I have two um, that were chatted to me. Um, first is who does a strategic plan and can it be done just internally by the board members or staff? Typically, organizations will hire someone to facilitate the strategic planning process. Um, it is possible, and I have done planning pro projects as a volunteer, that you could find someone in your community, a retired person perhaps, who has the skill and the background to do it. I think it's very hard for a board to to do it on their own, to have someone who can stand apart, um, keep the conversation on track, make sure all voices are heard, um, that's difficult. And if that role is assigned to the board chair, they're not really able to participate as well as they could as if you had an outside facilitator. Um, in other words, where can we find examples of what a strategic plan might look like? Well, you just go to Dr. Google and you start in, you can Google 
uh, preservation, strategic plans, um, any number of things. And I suspect that if um, the Alliance were to gather strategic plans of, of member organizations and make them available, of course, with permission, that could be very useful as well. I think we do have a few that we could share. Um, all right, this is a, I don't know if everyone can see this one. Um, Rudy says, suggestion, include a version of your mission statement as a final paragraph to any press releases you send out. Sometimes it will be cut, but sometimes it will make it to print. And that's another reason to make it as concise as you can get it. Um, every word counts. Um, I have another question. Um, is it best practice to do a plan every five years or whenever the last one expires, or is it only for a critical junction or juncture in a organization's life? Thank you for that question. I skipped over <laughs> that element that I did want to share. Um, typically, you know, a plan is for no more than five years. Um, I recommend that an implementation timeline only cover three years because effort made to plan in detail four years out is is rarely useful when you get to that fourth year um, because of, of changes that you haven't anticipated. Most um, funders will want to see a current strategic plan. And if yours is more than five years old, it, it won't carry the same amount of weight. So it's a lot of effort. Uh, some organizations do it every three years. I think for a small group, every five years could be sufficient. Right. All right. Susan, can you see the questions too that come in? Some of them, I don't know if they're just to me. I just see, so we are really, oops, it just disappeared. Um, Phil Franklin asks, so are we really talking about a rolling five years with yearly reviews for update? Um, let me try to describe it differently. I hope this answers your question. You want a five-year plan that has foundational elements that are enduring and that you stick with um, because to change course every year is not going to be useful um, to, to making real progress. The implementation plan, you're probably going to be refining, reviewing, updating every year as you move through your five-year plan. And I have a comment, Maggie, you might have the same observation too, but uh, having gone through a strategic, strategic planning process um, for my organization, I thought what was most useful is just the ability for your board and members to not talk about porta potties and lawn mowing and painting um, every single meeting, but to actually think about your organization's life and where you want it to go. And it kind of gave us an opportunity to just talk about um, our organization and not just the things that we do, if that makes sense. Right. And that that is the one of the best um, outcomes of a good process is renewed focus, energy, inspiration, um, you know, re new commit, renewed commitment to the mission and getting out of the weeds. You do get back in the weeds with the implementation timeline, but you don't start there. In fact, I would speak about the Preservation Alliance's strategic plan. It has five pillars or five areas of focus. And three of them are outward facing. One is related to providing preservation assistance to a broad range of people, but the other two focus um, for this year anyway, and many of you may have heard this on the preservation trades, and then what we can do to help people address changes in climate. Um, and then we have two internal goals, which are invest in orga organizational excellence and provide the resources to complete the strategic plan or to fund the strategic plan. And that one's about development and fundraising. And then the organizational excellence one is about the kinds of things we've talked about with board development, about accomplishing the strategic plan, but it's also do we need more staff? Um, do we need to update our computer systems? 
Do we need to hire some consultants? That kind of thing. So I think it's good to think about both the internal goals and then the outward facing goals that are more related to your mission. Right, and those pillars are, are akin to what I called strategic priorities. Mm -hmm. But I would just like to add, if they're not broken down into smart objectives and specific tasks and assignments, it's, it's hard to make progress because the everyday reality of things you're dealing with as they come down the pike, um, takes precedence and you can't make progress. I have a question for Susan. Um, as you're doing that, what, where does sort of your everyday stuff fit in? Like uh, a small staffed organization, for instance, like ours, people come through the door and want to speak with the director or want to speak with the field service representative. We don't plan for those things. Um, there may be unforeseen opportunities like, I don't know, staff training or something. Um, how do those fit in? What the the ongoing work of the organization, as opposed to the new stuff that you want to put in the strategic plan. Well, I think that if you're dealing with a zero-sum set of resources, that is, you're not expecting to expand your staff, then you need to think about how you're going to create space to do the extra that that the strategic strategic plan involves. So sometimes that's what are you not going to do? Or if there are constant interruptions, how do you remain responsive but keep control over your time? Like if people stop by, we'd say, oh, we'd love love to talk to you. She's available at X time, you know, once a month where she talks with people from the community. But mm -hmm. somehow you need to get control over, you know, because work always expands to fill the time, correct? So unless you're going to add more staff, if the strategic plan requires doing more and not just working differently, you got to figure out how you're going to carve out the time and the resources. Or, or again, people will want to ignore it because it's just stressful. It's just pointing out what they're not getting to, which does not create energy and focus. We've got a, a question um, here, should should you invite your community to every board meeting or just an annual meeting? Well, that is up to your board and what your purpose is. I don't think it's useful to invite the public to every board meeting. What do you think? I, I would say that as well. Um, some nonprofits are set up so that they actually have members and the bylaws say that the members vote on certain things like officers, and then you do need to have an annual meeting, but I think more and more that's not the norm. And so an annual meeting where perhaps you have a speaker and um, you do a presentation on what your group has accomplished that year without having the members actually vote, and this depends on your bylaws, of course, is a great thing to do just to have a public facing event where people can come meet you, learn about what you're doing, see who else is in the room and who else is supporting your organization. So I think that does build momentum in a great way. But I agree with Susan, don't invite people to every board meeting. You might have a guest or two a prospective board member might want to come to a board meeting. And I think that's very reasonable. I'd say that's the, the benefit of a, a, a nonprofit and versus a town committee is that you don't have the, <laughs> the public weighing in on your dollars and cents. And yeah. You know. Yes. Um, well, it's, it's one Oh four. Um, so if there are any more questions, feel free to shoot us uh, a message or, um, I think Susan and Maggie said you could stay on a little bit longer, but um, sure. And and I will say that if uh, if your group goes through a strategic planning process or even just a facilitated brainstorm, um, and it points out that you have uh, a building that might need to be unloaded or you might need to gain new members, then you should tune in for our next uh, Zoom webinars, um, and those are available. Uh, online on our calendar page. Um, and also we present them in our e-com e or e-communications that come out generally on Mondays. So stay tuned for those.